so we're today we're going through some of the bills that we have um, and I call I don't want to call them leftovers, but they are bills that we had wanted to look at during the whole COVID pandemic. So in that sense, they're left over as a result of the pandemic. And we have with us today, um, Senator Westman, the sponsor of S91, an act relating to parent-child network. Uh, and then after Senator Westman, you know, I'm gonna suggest, uh, Katie, uh, unless you uh, think otherwise, your opinion on having both Senator Westman and Senator Benning go back to back. What, is that okay with you? That's fine with me. Okay, good. And then that in that way, I don't wanna hold either one of you up from your morning uh, obligations. So Senator Westman, welcome. And thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, Rich Westman for um, the Senator from Lemoyo. Um, I, I would, say first off, I may be the lead sponsor on it, but on my screen, um, Senator Lyons, you're in between Senator Hardy and Senator Hooker. And um, um, they're both sponsors of the bill also. So um, we have a good crew um, to support um, parent child centers. Um, I um, specifically in the group worked with the parent child centers to um, help put together this bill. Um, and a little history, um, parent child centers were um, um, put in statute about 25 years ago now, sometime in the late 1990s. Mm -hmm. And since that time, parent child centers have become more formalized and the uh, amount of services they offer has um, expanded. And um, they become a lot more integral in um, the delivery of services in all of our communities. Um, just as a reminder, there are 15 parent child centers across the state now. And, um, and the breadth of their services, um, you know, um, is, is quite expansive. Um, they do home visits, they do early early childhood services, they do parent education, they do um, playground work, they do um, parent support groups, they offer concrete supports for the whole family, um, they do community development work, and they do research and, and referral. And all of those things, this bill would hold um, all of the 15 to doing that um, um, center-based work. Um, the bill establishes in statute the um, parent child uh, center network um, to ensure accountability among and distribute funds to designated child care centers. That's the first thing the bill does. It amends the criteria for designation as um, parent child centers. Um, those eight criteria would be in that portion. Um, it appropriates base funding um, to parent child center network. And I might say um, there's a section on funding in here that would have to be changed because this is last year's bill. We did take money, um, um, one time monies last year, and we took some um, of the COVID monies and put towards the parent child centers to help them um, with their work. Um, so the funding piece might need some work. It uh, um, would establish an annual inflation um, to monies appropriated to the Parent Child Center Network. I think given the last few years of, of history going um, back that the Health and Welfare Committee has been involved in some of the issues and the um, back and forth push on funding um, and services for the parent child center. That also is part of the reason that this all came up. We, um, um, some of the assessments and counseling, um, as you will remember, whether it should be at the state level in DCF or whether it should be um, in the parent child centers a couple of years ago was up as an issue. 
So, um, so the the broad outline is that this more formally puts them in place and tries to put them in a place where um, it formalizes their relationship with the state and the partnership that um, has developed and, um, and solidifies all of that. Um, and I um, sincerely hope that um, your committee takes it up. And as I said, the effective date of this bill would have been July 1st of last year. So um, there will be some um, changes in that, but the basic premise behind this is, um, is still e extremely valid and um, I think um, important for us to look at. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's terrific and, and thank you for uh, bringing this to us. Uh, and I, I think uh, that we will probably uh, go forward with the bill. We'll listen to Katie a little bit later about the details, but yep. then it, it, see, it sounds like some of the heavy lifting is gonna be done in your afternoon committee. Well, I, it, I think, you know, from the policy standpoint, establishing the network and the framework around that will, uh, will lay the groundwork for any work that any appropriation um, might, that might happen going forward in the future. And, and I do go back to those, um, the assessments and the counselors that we fought back and forth um, what role the, um, the parent child center should have. We, we need to look at um, all of that and that will dictate a lot of the way the money flows. Good, thank you for that comment. I think that is very helpful, terrific. Okay. Um, and, you know, I didn't mention it, it, you're the chair of a committee, and we did talk a lot about um, the, the role of the different players in the delivery of service to at-risk um, kids and families. And um, there may be a recommendation that you might speak to when we formally get a report. We're, we're, we're working on that. We're, uh, our, our final Child Care Protection Oversight Committee report coming to us soon. So this is good. It was chaired quite well, that committee. Thank you. <laughs> we're going to come full circle. <laughs> okay. Any questions for Senator Westman on his uh, sponsorship of the bill? Senator Hardy. Go ahead. I don't have I don't have a question, question Senator Westman, but I, I did want to just add, um, I first of all, I appreciate you did a great job. I appreciate your work on this bill over many, many years. Um, and I'm glad that we're taking this up early in the session and just wanted to also, um, you know, make the connection that we, we did a lot of really important work last session on early childhood education mm -hmm. and our parent child centers are a crucial part of that network and that system. And I, I think it's really important that we update their, their statutes and make them much more integrated into the work of the state when it comes to early childhood education and care. So thanks, um, Senator Westman. A majority of um, the parent child centers offer um, 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 child care. Yep. And I, I was going to say, I am sure when um, I'm off the screen that Senator Hardy and Senator Hooker can answer um, lots of questions about this. Of course. I, I, you know what, I, I don't want to let you leave without acknowledging Janet Munt, a former senator from Chittenden County who worked so hard to actually get parent child centers into statute. And it was really an honor to work with her uh, when I got into the Senate. So this is a continuation of, as you said before, a long history of involvement on part of many people. So thank yes, you. and I can't, I, I can't, with that, can't help but mention that um, at, at that time, the present chair of um, Senate Appropriations was the secretary of, of the right. agency and was <laughs> integral in the creation of their original. But that was 25 years ago, not to date 
any of us, but um, um, the, the world has changed. Yeah. And the pandemic doesn't help. No, it doesn't. Help. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and I think what we'll do at this point is we're going to switch gears over to uh, S69 and Senator Benning and have Senator Benning introduce his bill on suicide prevention in initiatives. Uh, and then after that, we'll go uh, to Ledge Council and walk through both bills. So Senator Benning, thank you for being here. Thank, thank you. you, Madam Chair. And um, let me say first that I'm Joe Benning. I represent the Caledonia District in the state Senate, the Caledonia District being all of Caledonia County and the six northeasternmost towns in Orange County. Um, Madam Chair, I'll, I'll start by saying I was very touched by your opening words, and I completely agree uh, that we have a unique opportunity as Vermonters to be able to chat with each other in a calm and civil uh, basis and do things that actually help people, which is what this particular bill is all about. I will also say uh, at the outset that I'm a little bit out of sorts at the moment, um, as horrible luck would have it. Um, I received a call during our LCAR meeting earlier this morning that one of my clients um, is suffering a mental breakdown, has been lodged, and I have to deal with that sometime today. So this is a um, very timely bill, even though it was identified as a leftover bill uh, from the previous session. I can appreciate the uh, committees taking the time to take it up, and I do hope that you will. Uh, first, the bill itself was um, pretty much born in a conversation with the administration. Um, where I said, you know, as Republicans, we're often batting back uh, other legislation that we, we don't like. Uh, what can we do that's positive? Um, and so we sat down and came up with a series of conversations that led to these entities you now see embedded in this bill. And I'm also happy to say I'm going to up Senator Westman by one and say three members of your committee are actually on this bill as well. Um, so I greatly appreciate the bipartisan efforts and we'll try to break the bill down in a short series of statements. Um, first, there is a request for $125,000 to go to the Department of Mental Health to increase to 70% the in-state call response at Vermont's local crisis call centers. Um, you might be interested in just hearing a list of who those call centers are, because every one of you has actually uh, got one of these entities in your backyard. The Clara Martin Center, Counseling Service of Addison County, the Howard Center, um, Healthcare and Rehab Services, Lamoille County Mental Health, Northwestern Counseling and Support Services, Pathways, Rutland Mental Health Services, United Counseling Service, Washington County Mental Health, and Northeast Kingdom Mental Health Services. Those call centers are critical, and I'm going to give an example of why I think we need to increase the funding. Sure. About uh, four and a half weeks ago, I was sitting in my law office, which happens to be on a major corner in the town of Linden. It starts, my office is actually on the ground floor. My sign is literally on the, the corner of a major intersection. And a homeless man who I had seen on the street several times um, and said hello to, we often chatted about life in general, but on this particular Friday evening as I was getting ready to walk out the door, um, it was the coldest night we had coming up for uh, weather-wise we were facing the coldest night of the year. And he came up my steps, literally shivering, um, saying that he had been kicked out of his residence, that he had no place to go, was literally shaking through this conversation and worried that he was going to freeze to death that night. Uh, I set about making a series of phone calls to crisis centers, and I was unfortunately unable to get anyone. So I took uh, the money that I had in my pocket, gave it to him and asked him to go to the 
Cumberland Farms next door, get himself something to eat. And then I drove to the house of a person that I know runs our local crisis center. Um, the good news is she was able to get him a bed for the night and then subsequently into the Veterans Administration uh, because he had serious me medical issues that needed attention. So not only did he uh, eventually get to where he needed to be, but the frustration that I had in trying to reach somebody at the call centers is a direct result of them just not having enough resources to have the man 24 seven. Um, the first section of this deals with that by asking that $125,000 uh, be donated to the Department of Mental Health for the purpose of increasing those call center responses. The second section has to do with uh, the headline of the article is zero suicide program, but there's a lot more to that conversation. Um, we are asking in section two to have $400,000 appropriated to the Department of Mental Health for two separate uh, portions, one to go to expanding the Vermont Suicide Prevention Center's zero suicide program throughout the state. And if you're not familiar with th what that is, I would simply suggest that you Google uh, zero suicide program in Vermont, and you'll be able to watch an 11 minute video that is specifically targeted at legislators um, to learn about the program and what their needs are. Um, the second section is that the um, money might be also shared to coordinate statewide suicide prevention efforts. This is a uh, a subject that is near and dear to me. I spent the past uh, 20 years or so as a motorcyclist riding with a group of motorcyclists around the North American continent. And we have all become very good friends and had uh, the ability to enter into each other's lives in a way that most people don't. Um, suffice to say, it was a very bonded group of individuals. And one of them, who was a veteran, decided to take his own life. And it had an impact on all of us, as well as that individual's families. The um, problem, especially with veterans, is something that I think we are only beginning to get hold of. We all understand that there is a problem. It doesn't take a rocket scientist when reading an obituary to learn uh, not just in the case of veterans, but in the case of any individual, when you're reading an obituary and you have no explanation of what happened to them uh, with respect to their death, uh, the chances are pretty good it is either a overdose uh, or a suicide. In the case of many of the overdoses, they are also suicides. Um, so how do we get a handle on that? Well, the answer is to try to get some money into these programs that are trying to assist. Um, this coordination effort is really a unification effort to learn what works and what doesn't work with respect to the multiple um, approaches that people have been taking and try to utilize as best we can whatever resources are available in those things that do actually work. And finally, in section three, um, there is a request for $50,000 to go to the Department of Disabilities, Aging and Independent Living, or um, for the purpose specifically of um, improving the elder care clinician program or to the vet to vet visitor program or both. Um, I think most of you are probably already aware of Dale's elder care clinician program. I'm not going to expand on that here, other than to say we're all getting older and eventually we ourselves may be uh, interested in partaking of some of these services. But I did want to talk a little bit about the uh, vet to vet program. It is a national program that is a consumer provider partnership uh, that utilizes veterans themselves in the recovery and a peer counseling capacity to help other veterans. Officially, there is a six week peer facilitator training program that teaches veterans how to facilitate peer group sessions and introduce program learning types. So the idea of getting veterans themselves to help each other 
is a very worthwhile program to address what I see as veteran suicide. And uh, hopefully we can get some more money donated to that cause. Um, I'll close with the thanks, I guess, for the members of this committee that joined on to this piece of legislation. I do think it's an ideal time to spend uh, money in these areas. This is somewhat out of my comfort zone because I don't usually come to the legislature and ask for money to go to certain programs. Um, that's just the nature of how I ran as a Republican. Um, but these are worthy programs and we have a very pressing need at this point in time. And I think it was George Aiken who said it best, if Vermonters can't help Vermonters, what's the reason we have government? I'll end it with that and be happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Senator Benning. Uh, that was great. Um, any, any questions from folks? I know we'll have to get uh, some testimony on the details of all the programs and the content of the bill after we go through it with Katie. So, Senator Hardy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Senator Benning, since this bill was la introduced last year, are these amounts still accurate? I, I think I heard something that there may be something in the governor's budget about suicide prevention. Mm -hmm. And so I'm assuming that there's, that these numbers may be updated. Is that? Uh, yes, correct? if I had any critique of his uh, presentation yesterday, I was hoping he was gonna mention my name and my bill. But um, <laughs> there, are, there are numbers that are currently designated in that budget presentation. I have not updated myself, Senator, to figure out whether they match what's in this bill. The bill is a, a placeholder, if you will, to get the conversation going about what should be done. And, and thank you for your question, because it reminds me that the last section of the bill had a uh, effective date that needs to be changed as well. Right. Um, and just, just to put a thank you, Senator, just to put a bookmark in on possible witnesses, I think it would be helpful to have... Um, the adjutant general come in and talk about efforts that he has been doing with the National Guard. I've talked to him several times um, and he's part of a national group um, working on suicide prevention in for National Guards and veterans. So I love to hear that, Senator Terrence. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to figure out which one of us is it? I don't know. What, I'm who, sorry. who has I'm the sorry. question? Who has no, the question? No, it's wonderful. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, Ruth, would you mind getting, uh, Senator Hardy, getting that contact information? And Senator Benning, I might ask you also sure. if you have specific recommendations for uh, testimony. Um, we'll, I, we'll, we'll sort it out. We're pretty good in here about knowing who's who. Through yeah, I, I, can, I can say right off the bat, uh, Senator, that the administration does wish to participate in this conversation. Well, we will, we will, we will welcome them. Amen. Okay. All right. Thank you. Senator Thank Tarantini, you, you have a question. Hold on here. We got you. Sure. one more question. No, I, uh, I, I appreciate um, you calling on me, Senator Lyons. Sorry about the little one there. He was uh, frustrated. He couldn't get the Dunkin' Donuts in his mouth. So, uh, <laughs> um, uh, Senator Benning, thanks for advancing this. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, mornings like this that remind me why I ran for the Senate to start with. Uh, and that's for good legislation like this. And thank you, Senator Lyons, for um, you know us discussing it. And hopefully, we can we can make some headway with it this uh, this back half of the session because it's it's critically important. It seems like we're hearing more and talking more about suicide and what we can do to prevent it, especially in light of the pandemic. And uh, so I'm I'm thrilled that we're going to discuss this. Terrific, Senator Hooker. Thank you, Senator Lyons, and thank you, Senator Benning. I just want to add my thanks and um, especially thank you for including elders because we hear a lot about suicide among young people and veterans, but sometimes we forget that people who are elderly uh, enter into those dark spaces, and I appreciate that. Thank you. I would say especially during these times of COVID. Yes. The elder yes. population is very lonely, and that's a, a, a critical issue right now for us to be addressing. All right. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, Thank you all. We'll see you all on the right. floor. Oh, yes. That's right. 
All right, Katie, uh, we're, um, I'm gonna, uh, what, what we have in front of us is about 45 minutes left and we have two other bills. Are these, the, the last, these two bills, I think are the ones that really um, need a little more in-depth presentation at this point. So let's go through those two bills and then hopefully we'll have a half an hour left or close to it to go through the bills that Jen will be uh, helping us with the other two, S74 and S H153. But Katie, thanks for being here. You're welcome. Katie McLean, Office of Legislative Counsel. Welcome back. It's nice to see everyone. Um, I will go in the order that the sponsors presented. So I'll pull up S91 first. Seeing, are you seeing what I'm seeing, S91? Okay. We got it. Great. Um, so this, as Senator Westman said, is the Parent Child Center Network Bill. Uh, as he mentioned, there's already language, there's a chapter in statute dedicated to the Parent Child Centers. So this bill updates that chapter. Um, so we're focused more on a network than individual centers. And you'll see that the title changes on line 16 and lines 18 and 19 reflect that change that we're, we're talking about it, a network and not individual centers. So first, the definition of parent-child center is, uh, the proposal is to update it to mean a community-based organization that serves as a central hub and lead provider of primary prevention services for families with young children on behalf of the state. And this section also adds a definition of the Parent Child Center Network, which means an AHS community partner composed of designated parent child centers that ensures accountability and collaboration among designated parent child centers. Um, and subsection B, where we're pretty much striking out most of the language here at the introduction of subsection B, and there's new language being added that um, shows how the network can be expanded. So this language says that the network can recommend to the secretary of AHS or designee one or more new parent child centers for designation every six years. And upon receipt of this recommendation from the network, the secretary or designee is to review um, each center that's recommended by the network for designation to ensure that it meets the criteria that is set forth below in subsection C and that a um, parent-child center that's recommended by the network and determined to meet the criteria that we'll look at next um, is to be deemed by the secretary or the secretary's designee to be part, um, to be a designated parent-child center and part of the network. So subsection C, um, these are, this is the criteria for designation. And you'll see some of the language in subsection C is not underlined. So this is existing law. Um, receiving funding from one or, one or more private local federal sources, um, qualifying for a tax exemption under 501c, um, and then having a parent representative on its board of directors representing designated geographic catchment area. That's all an existing law. But the new criteria begin on line 15. So that is completing a peer review every three years, which is to be conducted by the network providing each of the eight core services that we'll look at next in subsection D, indicating an intent to participate in the network as a member, and lastly, working to achieve population level quality of life outcomes uh, related to children and families. So those are the criteria. One of the criteria, as I mentioned, was um, having one of the eight core competencies. So that language is set forth below in subsection D. So here we have the list of the core competencies that each parent designated parent-child center would have to um, have in order to be part of the network. So a designated parent-child center would do home visits, provide early childhood services, provide parent education, host play groups and parent support groups, offer concrete supports, provide community development and resources and referrals. So those are the eight core competencies. Um, and then there's um, a clause that says that any parent-child center that was in existence last year, January 1, 2021, is deemed to have met the designation requirements. 
The next section has to do with funding and how um, sort of the mechanism for funding works for the network. So in subsection A, the secretary is to annually disperse a joint appropriation for all of the parent child centers to the network. And it's the network that would be distributing the funding to each parent child center. Um, and then any increase to base funding would be um, based on community need, provision of additional services, or the designation of a new center. In subsection B, the network is to work in partnership with AHS to develop appropriate measures of accountability and to provide any financial or programmatic information as necessary to enable the secretary to evaluate the services provided through grant funds and um, the effect of the services on consumers and the accounting of the expenditure of grant funds. And then lastly, there's language in subsection C that in determining the annual appropriation for the network, the secretary is to employ an annual inflation factor. And the guidelines there, um, the inflation factor is reasonable and adequately uh, reflects economic conditions. And then you have an appropriation. It's, um, this bill was introduced last year. So this appropriation is for fiscal year 2022. So if you were to move forward, this would of course have to be updated, but it was um, 7.5 million in fiscal year 2022 to the network. And then effective date again would have to be updated if you moved forward with this draft. So that is the first bill. Okay, let's just pause for a second. I don't wanna get into a discussion around the various sections of the bill until we've had an opportunity to hear testimony, but your presentation is pretty clear. Um, so it would allow for the parent child centers to be part of a broader network, uh, both in the state and then nationally. So we will, and the appropriation piece is something that all the money ends up down the hallway but we'll, uh, so we'll take, you know, unless I hear differently from folks, we will uh, probably follow through uh, with some testimony on this bill and look to see how we can make improvements if necessary. Right. Any questions of clarification? All right, good. Katie, back to you. Okay. Uh, pull up S sixty nine. Your voice, you your your wait, your your sound just went down. I don't know why. Maybe it'll come back as you speak. We'll try it. Can you it. hear me? Very little. I, you can't hear me. Yes, I'm we can. Muted. Keep can. going. Okay. It'll come. I'm not it'll muted. Come. I'm not sure what's happening. There it is. No, you know it happened before. It just um, it takes a minute to get back up. So okay, let's see what happens. So are you seeing S69? I might have to stop, share, and restart. Oh, it We're did. Good. Okay, you're good. Great. So Senator Benning did most of my work on, on this bill, but as he described, um, this bill is a series of sections. Each section has an appropriation for a different program aimed at suicide prevention. Uh, as he also noted, this bill was introduced last year, so all of the appropriations are for fiscal year 22. And if you chose to move forward with this bill, you'd have to update the fiscal years and um, possibly the amounts. Um, so the first section is the Vermont's um, National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. So this was an $125,000 appropriation for fiscal year 2022 to the Department of Mental Health for the purpose of increasing the in-state call response at Vermont's local crisis call centers to 70%. The next appropriation in section two is for two programs. So in fiscal year 2022, the appropriation is for 400,000 to the Department of Mental Health. The first um, program that this appropriation would be for is for the um, Suicide Prevention Center's Zero Suicide Program throughout the state. And that program is a system-wide framework to prevent suicide among individuals under the care of the health and mental health systems throughout the state. And the second program under um, that that 400,000 would be appropriated for is establishing a new position, a full-time position that would be shared between the departments of health and mental health 
to coordinate statewide suicide prevention efforts in coordination with the US Department of Veterans Affairs. And lastly, there's a $50,000 appropriation in fiscal year 2022 um, for, to Dale for the purpose of expanding the elder care clinician program or the vet to vet visitor program or both of those programs. And as Senator Benning said, the vet to vet visitor program um, involves um, veterans being paired with aging or disabled veterans um, to meet them in their homes for um, multiple visits a month, two to three visits a month. And then last week, we have an effective date of July 1, 2021, which would need to be updated if you chose to move forward with this piece of legislation. Okay, thank you. Um, this one is, uh, this one it has a lot of money in it. So one of the, the, our job is going to be to evaluate the policy that's in here. And I'm, I'm going to suggest that we have some other bills in the committee that have recently been introduced. Uh, uh, Senator Hooker and I uh, and others have put some bills in and I'm, I'm thinking that it might be helpful for us to go through those bills as well and to see if there's some integration that we can make, you know, and that instead of, but uh, my, my concern is if, if a bill doesn't require an appropriation, we may not want to have to send it to appropriations. So we'll take a little time to look at the bills that have come to us around mental health issues, and then we can have that discussion together after we've gone through uh, those bills as well. But this one, um, certainly mental health at every stage of life is, uh, pretty much of an emergency right now. So just uh, we'll go with that. Any questions of clarification at this point? All right, good. Yes, no, Senator Benning did your job, Katie, and you, but you did it. <laughs> you, you're the only one who can do your job. <laughs> All right. Uh, so Katie, thank you. And, um, Help us identify some of the uh, legislation that we have in our committee that we might look at concurrently with S69. Not that we want to put them all together, but there might be some pieces that fit. That would help. In all of your spare time. <laughs> okay. Good. All right. We'll, we, we'll move on. We're, we're, we're on a good trajectory of time. So um, Senator McCormick is here and we'll move on to the next bill, which is S-74. And um, Senator McCormick, I'm asking you to be as um, concise as possible. After you have testified as uh, lead sponsor, then we'll have Jen Carby go through the bill more specifically. Thank you, Madam Chair. I like to think I'm always concise. Um, <laughs> I'm for the record, Senator Richard McCormick doing business as Dick McCormick. Uh, I'm a former member of this committee, actually two go rounds over the years, and um, chief sponsor of um, uh, S74. I've submitted written testimony and my spoken testimony will follow that outline, although I'd rather not read what you already have in front of you. Um, S-74 makes technical changes to uh, Act 39, which is the uh, now the existing Vermont law uh, providing medical assistance in dying. Um, when we passed Act 39, it was a fairly innovative law. Uh, there was not a lot of experience to look at. Uh, and we relied heavily on the exist what was then the existing law in Oregon. When Oregon passed their law, they had nothing to look at. And a good deal of the Oregon discussion, pro and con, was conjectural. Uh, the the uh, advantages of the, of the bill were, were conjectural 
And so were various uh, anxieties about possible problems. And remedies were conjectural. The Oregon law, which Vermont used as our model, um, is rich in safeguards against possible abuses. We now have, I think it's 11 states with similar laws. Oregon goes back to the 90s. This has been the law in Vermont for many years. And we now have solid realities to look at and base on which to base the law. What this bill does is it addresses three uh, areas of Act 39 that uh, have been demonstrated to be unnecessary and burdensome for, for dying people who try to use the law. Uh, the, the, the first uh, change that the bill would make has to do with telemedicine. When we passed this law, uh, telemedicine was an idea. It was an innovation. Uh, now it's, it's uh, boilerplate. It's how it's often done. I had the privilege as a member of this committee of, of speaking on the floor about telemedicine as, as, as a response to COVID, for example. Uh, and um, the law as it is presently written requires that a request from a dying person for a prescription be made in person. Uh, that is an anomaly. Uh, Telemedicine is now frequently used. The usual procedure against, there are times when telemedicine is probably not appropriate and where an in-person uh, meeting with patient and doctor are necessary. And the standard procedure is that that's up to the doctor. And uh, were this to pass into law, uh, the doctor would still have the option upon a, an electronic communication of saying, I think I need to see you in person. But this allows for that. This return. This this um, makes the 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 law under Act Thirty Nine consistent with usual medical practice, which is that that the doctor would decide whether or not telemedicine is is acceptable or not. Um, the the uh, the second uh, provision has to do with that. There the present law has a fairly long procedure to obtain a prescription and involve and includes a two week delay for just to make sure that the patient is not acting hastily. And there's the present law requires that after the two week delay, there's an additional 48 hours. Uh, and this bill would remove that 48 hour additional requirement. Finally, the bill uh, makes explicit what our attorney general says is implicit in the law, and it is this, the, the present law as written provides protection for doctors who participate in medically aiding, med medically hastening death. Uh, it does not provide, it does not explicitly provide those protections to pharmacists and other healthcare givers. And S-74 would ex make explicit what is already implicit. And this is not a technicality. One could say, well, if pharmacists are already covered, there's really no problem. The problem is that the pharmacists don't rely, are, are, are not confident in that implicit protection. Uh, the feet on the ground reality is Vermont has one pharmacist who will prescribe. And then there are near what, nearby pharmacist in New Hampshire. So that the, the access to this benefit is, is, is impeded by the three provisions in law that the bill uh, seeks to address. And uh, I'll, answer questions or I'll go back to my morning committee. Thank you, Senator. Uh, that was um, very clear. And as you said, you're always concise. Always. <laughs> <laughs> so um, questions uh, for Senator McCormick as lead sponsor of the bill. And Senator McCormick, we know that you have worked on this issue for many years and appreciate your um, consistent support of the work in the legislature on this. Um, Thank you. And, and you and I have worked together. I, I think uh, the, my first session 
uh, I worked on this with Dick Walters, and now yeah. he is no longer with us. So, yeah. Right. And I should mention Claire Anger. She was chair yes. of this committee yeah. when we did this. And yeah, she was. Yeah. It was a. It was a. It's been a handoff consistently, and it's been a good collaborative uh, process. So I do want to say, and I think you did uh, say this or imply it at least, that this bill is about fixing what we already have in place. It's not about validating or uh, putting in place our current program. Okay, so let's Let's move on to um, Senator. I'm going to say thank you and take care thank of the you. natural world. We'll try. Bye. All right. uh, Jen, thanks for being here this morning. And we, I guess we'll just dive into looking at um, S74 and going through its provisions briefly. And then after that, we'll move on to our, our next bill. Right. Well, good morning, Jennifer Carvey from the Office of Legislative Counsel, and I will put the language up on the screen. I think. Uh, let me find where I've hidden it. All right. Can you see? Can you see the S seventy four language of S seventy four? No, we have no. some statutory uh -oh. language up well, that's on health care facility right. definition. Oh, well, we're in that same statute, but I'm, for whatever reason, having trouble finding my, here we go. Now, can you see it? Yes, thank yes. you. Oh, good. All right. Um, so this is S-74, and I think um, Senator McCormick did a good job of, of walking you through what the provisions are, but I will show you what they look like in context. Um, and as both the chair and Senator McCormick mentioned, these are changes to an existing um, framework that has been set up for um, allowing patients to request medication, certain patients to request medication for the purpose of hastening death. Um, so in the first section here, we're looking at the requirements for the prescription and documentation and the way this law is um, set up it talks, it's really done through the, the lens of the physician who would be doing the prescribing. And so uh, it talks about the types of things that the, or the actions that the physician must take in order to not be subject to any civil or criminal liability or professional disciplinary action for prescribing this medication. And so the first changes here deal with, um, as Senator McCormick said, whether the request, the oral request from the patient must be made in the physician's physical presence uh, or whether it could be done in another manner such as telemedicine. Um, and so in this case is striking through two requirements that the oral requests, the first one and the second one that must be at least 15 days after the first request be done in the physician's physical presence. Similarly, it would eliminate a requirement that the physician's examination of the patient to determine that the patient was suffering from a terminal condition be based in part on the physician's physical examination. So the examination would not need to be a physical examination, um, could be done through telemedicine or another means and the review of the patient's relevant medical records. And finally, in this section, um, they would eliminate the 48 hour delay requirement um, for the physician writing the prescription, which under the current law, and this is actually why I had this language up on my other screen, um, it requires the physician to have written the prescription after the last to occur of three events, those being the patient's written request for medication, the patient's second oral request, and the physician offering the patient an opportunity to rescind the request. So those would all still be there, but this would get rid of the 48 hour delay between the last of those events to occur and the physician writing the prescription. And then the second section of the bill would add some specific language to an existing provision on limitations on actions that would say that no person shall be subject to civil or criminal liability or professional disciplinary action 
for acting in good faith compliance with the provisions of this chapter. So under the existing law, there are some other provisions on limitations on actions, um, one specifying that physicians, nurses, and pharmacists, and anyone else is not under any duty, cannot be under any duty by law or contract to participate in providing medication to a patient under this chapter, and specifying that a healthcare facility and healthcare provider cannot subject a provider to discipline, suspension, loss of license, loss of privileges, or other penalties for actions taken in good faith reliance on the provisions of the chapter or refusals to act under the chapter. Um, this would add language saying that nobody would be subject to civil or criminal liability or professional disciplinary action as long as they were acting in good faith compliance with the provisions of this chapter. And it would take effect on passage. Okay, thank you, Jen. That was sure. really clear, the combination of Senator McCormick's uh, explanation and, and going through the bill is very helpful. And it does remind us that there are other conditions surrounding some of each of the three. So that's also helpful. Um, questions for Jen, clarification. Obviously we have questions about data that supports um, making these changes and we'll, we'll get testimony in that will help us uh, understand why the requests are being made. Okay, wow, we're good. So unless I hear differently, uh, again, this is a bill that we would like to uh, hear more about and we'll, we'll move forward on that. 